uh, which have nothing to do with propagating selfish genes. Uh, and I, for one, am very happy about that, but I think it's a very intriguing point you've, you've, you've raised, that there is this kind of tension between the original quote purpose for which we were put into the world and the, and the, the, the private purposes which we all dream up inside ourselves. Finish the next book, write the next symphony, um, uh, win the next football match, whatever, whatever it is, which are making use of goal-seeking activities which were put into our brains by the selfish genes for a very different purpose. Okay, you're Thank happy you. with that? I want to go up here now because the <coughs> gentleman's been waiting there for a while, I think. Hi, Professor Hawkins. Oh. Right. Um, Sorry, actually, would you wait just one second? Sorry, I wanted to go to the person in the middle row. Is there someone there waiting? Yes? Or not? My right, question was uh, more relevant to the last day, <coughs> the last question, which is fairly well answered. Okay, all right, that's fine. If you're happy, then that's good. We'll move on. So, this lady up the top. Yeah. Thank you. I would like to ask you a question about reproduction. Uh, if two people, they do want to have a children and um, uh, a child, and uh, it's a male who is 25 year old, and also the female is the same. Um, I think both of the sperm cell and the egg cell would be at that age. So why is the new cell they made together and becomes zero year, like becomes zero? Is it because that the gene is what they passed on from generation to generation? And I was wondering also, is gene, does gene has a, have an age? I'm sorry, I didn't quite... Do genes have an age in effect? The point is, if two 25-year-olds have a child, the child starts at year zero, I think, is the point that she's making. I think if, if you think of Dolly the Sheep, for instance, when they cloned Dolly the Sheep, oh, oh, the, oh, the oh, gene there actually was quite an old gene, it turned out. Dolly was born, was she not, at the same age as the, the mother where they'd taken the gene from? Um, that, if, if that's the question, I mean, there, there was certainly a, a suggestion that, that, that because Dolly, uh, when she was a lamb, was cloned from a cell of an adult sheep, that Dolly's cells might have the same age as the adult sheep from which um, she was cloned. I don't think that would be in the same way true if, um, say, a 75-year-old man um, had a child in the ordinary way. What's much more likely is that the sperm would be a, a rather less viable sperm but I don't think it would be right to say that the child would, would start life, so to speak, with an, with an advanced age. That, that wouldn't be the, the, the right way to put it. Okay. Let's move over here. Gentleman here. Um, hi. I'd just like to ask Richard um, what your opinion in, on, say, philosophy is hard, maybe, on any of your work. Um, I do tend to think sometimes that you are kind of maybe sometimes revising Nietzsche in the fact that God is dead, and maybe now can we just have the evidence to provide and say that, well, God is dead, we have no more need for him. I've never really understood this God is dead uh, quote from, from Nietzsche. Um, why say God is dead rather than that God never existed in the first place? Yes, um, I understand that say God is dead and the fact that we, we have not killed God literally, but that God is dead, that we have no longer the use in we no longer need the idea of God anymore in our lives and we can finally disband that because we no longer need that to survive. Yes, I mean, um, I, I'm, I'm inclined to ag ag agree with that, but what, what's, what's the question? The question was just how much maybe any philosophy it had uh, in, in your work, any impact any philosophers had had within your work. And any, any what, sorry? Any philosophers. philosophers have had. Oh. Have they influenced you in any way? Oh, oh, oh sorry, okay. Um, any philosophers. Um, I'm not desperately well read in philosophy, I have to confess. I'm a, I'm a scientist and um, the philosophers that I've read have not been um, very, very many. I, I probably should, should uh, confess to that. Um, so I probably can't really answer your question very well. Okay, thank you. Anyway. Okay. Gentleman over here now. Professor Dawkins, uh, two points on the God delusion and points that you had uh, raised this evening as well. First is one just to commend you on this idea of critical eva evaluation uh, and particularly amongst children. 
Uh, I myself am a Christian youth worker, and if I've gained something from your book, it is the avoidance of indoctrination. And in the practice that I, I actually go with now, is to ask children to think for themselves. It's to be very careful about that, to present scripture to them, and ask them to make their own judgments about it. So that is something I've gained from your book that I thank you for. The other is a sticking point I have, though, with, with one of the central things as you describe it in your book. Um, I am of the contention that, that something began the universe, that much I'm persuaded by. Uh, you talk, if I've understood you correctly, I apologise if I haven't, um, if I've understood you, it's necessary that what began the universe is something simple. Uh, and indeed, the physics <coughs> seems to be homing in on that. What I just can't quite get a grasp of logically is why necessarily the thing that began the universe has to be simple. Why can it not be an incalculably complicated entity which began the universe that is outside of the universe? Okay, thank you. Um, something that is complicated is, to me, by definition, statistically improbable. If you look at the main arguments that are used by creationists against evolutionists, they are nearly always of the form, look at an eye, look at a haemoglobin molecule, look at a heart. It is immensely complicated. The probability that if you got the bits of an eye and shook them up together at random, you would get something that could see is vanishingly small. If you took the bits of a haemoglobin molecule and shuffled them at random, the probability is all but zero. And some of them even work out the odds against, you know, 10 to the whatever it is, um, odds against. So everybody seems to accept, and I do as well, the argument that says that statistically improbable things don't just happen, or they have a very, 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 very low probability of happening. A perfect hand at bridge, we know how often it happens, but it's very, 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 very rare. So anybody who postulates a theory which is equivalent to dealing themselves a perfect hand at bridge has got a very bad theory. The creationist argument against evolution is always of this form. They always think that evolution is a theory of chance, and therefore they think that they have um, disproved evolution by pointing out that to get something like an eye or a haemoglobin molecule is about as equivalent, about as improbable as getting a perfect hand at bridge. I accept that criticism if evolution were a theory of chance. Evolution is not a theory of chance. It's a theory of non-random survival. Evolution by natural selection is the only theory we know of that is capable of generating improbability equivalent to an eye or a haemoglobin molecule by sensible mechanisms rather than by the sheer luck of getting a perfect hand at bridge. Now a god who is capable of designing the universe, a god who is moreover capable of listening to your prayers, forgiving your sins, raising you from the dead, redeeming your sins, such a God, it, over and above creating the universe, over and above inventing the Big Bang, over and above setting the fundamental constants and laws of physics, would have to be the most stupendously perfect hand of bridge. And that is, it seems to me, to be a perfectly straightforward argument using the standard creationist argument, which they wrongly use against evolution, but using it correctly to turn it back on them against God himself. I'm sorry to come back, I promise I'll leave Just the very briefly, after this. Quite a few people with um, uh, all I would say in response to that is that seems a very good argument against uh, a creationist. If I say to you that, yes, I'm very comfortable with evolution as you have <coughs> described it, and I see that as a, as a workable pattern, um, the argument about things coming about by chance and the improbability of that surely then doesn't apply to the God who would begin that as well. Well, okay, if, if the God that you wish to postulate is an exceedingly simple entity, some kind of quantum fluctuation, then 
we have no, no disagreement because clearly that's the kind of theory that we're looking for, that's the kind of theory that physicists are looking for. But then you cannot make that God do duty to forgive your sins, listen to your prayers and things like that. You cannot have it both ways. Either the God you're talking about is a simple quantum fluctuation, in which case I agree with you, we're simply arguing about words. I, I wouldn't use the word God. But if you're trying from that to smuggle in a God who, who listens to prayers and forgives sins, then, then you cannot have it both ways. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Now, we've only got about 15 minutes left, ladies and gentlemen, so I would ask if you're queuing to ask a question, if you could keep it relatively brief. And I'm going to ask Professor Dawkins to do, this, Dawkins to do the same. I know it's not easy, but gentlemen here.